Good evening, everyone. I'm Jonathan House from Treasure Monster Incorporated Toy Group, accompanied by Chance Mathis from the Toy Stash, Eric Sparks from Turtle Traders, and we are thrilled beyond measure to have with us today American actor, screenwriter, director, former stuntman, martial artist, and author of this amazing book, Teenage Ninja to Mutant Turtle. I present to you the man, the myth, the legend, Ken Scott. Hi, guys. It's great to be here with you today. I mean, Thanks a lot, Eric, Jonathan, Chance. I'm excited. We've been planning this for a little while, so we get a chance to hang out and talk with you guys and everybody out there. It's going to be fun. For yeah, sure. for sure. Yeah. Happy to have you, man. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, we were going to go ahead and hand it off to uh, Eric to kick off the, the conversation with you, if that's all right. Awesome. Yeah. Ken, I, I can't thank you enough for being here. This is, uh, for Turtle fans like us, this is this is a pretty big dream to be able to talk to the real Raphael. Like that, it's, it's a big deal. Um, we've seen the movies, I don't even know how many times, a million times. We're all a little nervous because you're like a big celebrity for us. So. Uh, well, hey, let me say this too. Uh, I appreciate that you guys recognize me as Raphael. Oftentimes there's a lot of different guys that can be Raphael, even from the same movie. So I want to give props out to Josh Pice, who was the original actor in the first movie while I was his stunt double. And then he moved on. Um, there was Ho Sung Pak, uh, who was the stunt double in Secret of the Ooze. So yes, I'm one part of Raphael and it's good to be here to whatever I can do to share that part with you guys. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And there, there are definitely a lot of great guys that make up all the turtles um, and they do a lot. Yeah, your book, your book was super, um, it was a pretty amazing book. It gave us a really good insight into everything that, that went on, not, not just your lead up into, into getting in there, but I had no idea what it took to, to be a turtle, right? The fact that four right. guys made that happen. Yeah, um, let, me, hey, let, let me throw this out there too, because there's yeah. probably a lot of people listening that don't know we talked a little bit before. I made a deal with these guys where I was like, look, yeah, let's get together and talk and do the podcast. But I wrote a book about becoming a Ninja Turtle. It's called Teenage Ninja to Mutant Turtle, Becoming the Real Raphael. And I said, before we talk, I would just ask if you guys could read the book. And then that way you kind of know a lot of stuff and there's things we can talk about and things like that. So I appreciate you guys taking on that challenge. It makes it a lot more fun to have this conversation. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And we did. We all grabbed a copy. We all read it all up. Uh, and it was fantastic. It's it's truly is a really good book. We've recommended it on our pages of, for multiple uh, days now for people to go check it out and read oh, it. Yeah. It's a super easy read too. Like I was able to read in a couple of days, um, which is always awesome. It wasn't. Yeah, it's a really fast read. The chapters are just a few pages. I tell everybody it's good bathroom reading and yeah. it's good reading right before you go to bed at night. <laughs> so I have an eight and a 13 year old and having chapters that are like two or three pages long at a time perfect. was so perfect. To be able to be like, yeah, give me a second, and I get to knock out a chapter, and then I'm ready to go, and I can do whatever I need to do. It was, it was, it was written really well. I have one of the probably one of the best reviews I had of a book is, uh, you know, I'm I'm a big fan of action heroes, even in real life, like police officers, and I gave it to a friend of mine who's been a, a police officer for 40 years, and he came back to me and he said, I would, he goes every night when it was time to go to bed, he goes I would get excited because I knew that meant I was going to read some of your book. He goes, but then as I read it, I would keep seeing how little was left and I was getting disappointed because it was going to run out. Yeah. And I was like, man, that's awesome. So, yeah. Thanks. Well, I'm glad awesome. you guys enjoyed it. Thanks. I think you're the only uh, Amazon review I've ever given was for your book. Oh, right on. I'm pretty, I don't think I've ever done that before, but yeah, I definitely had to on Amazon. Well, Amazon reviews are super valuable to into independent and self-published authors. It's kind of like the only way they have to show the powers that be that their book or their work of art or whatever it is, is having an impact and people like it. Once they start reviewing it, it, it helps the algorithms. It helps everything. So more people get to see it. It's all that stuff. So that's the, the best thing anybody can do. If you know somebody that's an independent author that's on Amazon is give them a review for the book. It really helps them out. So I'm sure. Happy to do it, man. Happy to do it. I appreciate it guys. I will go add my review right after this. Then I, I cool. had no idea. That's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, we definitely want to dive into the book. We want to hear just, a, I mean, honestly, just your, your life, how you got there, like everything like that, that everything that we read and that, you know, the listeners can can hear. But I thought maybe we'd start out just current, you know, like, what are you up to today? And then we'll then we'll go backwards and we'll dive into kind of the start of the book and how you got where you are. Right on. Well, I live in Fort Worth, Texas now. I've lived here for about eight years. Uh, I moved here after being in Los Angeles for about 22 years which is the longest I've spent in one place in my whole life. I grew up in North Carolina before that, 
was born in New York before that. But so I've been in uh, for, uh, Fort Worth, Texas for a while. And I use my creativity now. I'm the chief marketing officer. I'm a marketing executive. Yeah. Um, I was chief creative officer at a couple of uh, ad agencies. I'm the chief marketing officer of a company now. So I oversee production and creative advertising schedules and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of what I do. And then um, outside of living my life of trying to be a regular martial artist as much as I can, I, that's kind of my one thing. That's like my church and my everything. I try to do that. Outside of that, just try to have a life with some friends and a dog and, you know, work out and I'm trying to write another book. And um, I'm constantly working with people on creative projects. I'm, I'm dealing with some sources now on a screenplay of some interesting stories, but it's all just for fun. You know, you know, I don't pursue Hollywood uh, things like I don't pursue acting or anything like that anymore. Right. Um, but that's it. Now I'm an author. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, I'll be anxious to hear them or see the new book when it comes out. Any, any want to sneak peek or maybe we save that for the end? Or tell us. What well, right, right now it's called Showdown in Hollywood. Uh -huh. It's about how it's about how I went on after my success in Ninja Turtles. I continued to pursue my dream of wanting to be an action hero, and I have this crazy fun story about how I ended up teaming up with Imperial Entertainment, who made Lionheart with Jean Claude Van Damme, yeah. and they ultimately wrote and produced a movie for me starring me and billy blanks called showdown yes uh which you can see on amazon prime for free oh, right now already did yes, yes. He, oh, he, yeah yeah we, we watched it yeah, so. we watched it the other night right on. so Love showdown it. surprisingly enough you know most people know me just because of my involvement in ninja turtles but th there's a lot there's a whole other sub genre and crowd that know me because of showdown it was a theatrically released successful martial arts movie in 1994 i think it was 93 94 huge internationally um i'm big in germany <laughs> it was called american karate tiger in germany yes, yeah, yes. All that, the, all yeah and, it, poster, and, yeah. and it was vo and, and i'm voiced over in that movie by a very famous german actor it's the same guy who's in quentin tarantino's inglorious bastards he plays the character of stiglitz oh and, yeah yeah that's the guy who does my voice in the german version of showdown so sure. man i wish i had it just today Somebody from Germany sent me a whole fan art. God, it's in the next room. They painted me like in the fight. I got this enormous head. They painted me <laughs> and they painted a picture of Raphael. And they're anyway, yeah, showdown. So the, the book is all about my adventures of getting to showdown. And then ultimately after showdown, I wrote, produced and directed a movie of my own called Adventures of Johnny Dow. And it's the kooky story of how I raised half a million bucks and made a movie and all that kind of stuff. Wow. That's so, awesome. I've heard about that too. The second movie you just mentioned. Yeah. You, you used to be able to watch it on Amazon prime, but now it's gone. Yeah. Now I got to figure Now there's other distribution ways to try to get it out there. It was huge on DVD. Wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. That, well, one of the things, so one question though, I guess we'll kind of use to kind of kick off the book a little bit, but one of the things for me, as I was reading through it is you kind of have this um, underlying theme throughout the whole thing where I wrote it down kind of the way to summarize it up, where you're always putting positive energy into the pursuit of your dream, right? And something you said in a kind of a later chapter was uh, you come to learn that it's part of the journey, the, the negatives, but you just have to keep moving and overcome the next challenge. And for me, like everything that you wrote in your book and where you started and stuff like that was, was you taking one step at a time and taking one challenge at a time. And I'm kind of curious to know, like going back to the beginning, you, you were 13 years old, I think, when you started karate, is that right? Yeah, 12. Yeah. 12 years old, sorry, 12 years old. Um, where did that come from? Like, like where what where did that that mindset, I guess, come from that it's kind of led you all the way through this? Wow, you know, uh, that's a good question. I would like to say that things like my martial arts practice, which teach perseverance and dedication and all that, um, I, I certainly that's the tools and the mechanisms that help shape who I am but somewhere in my elemental DNA is just a driving force. Um, you know, just go, go, go and get and do and want and this and that. And some of it early on is dri driven just out of selfishness. You know, I want, I want, I want this, I want that. And I even say in the book, you know, I, I looked at the actors who were in front of me as I was pursuing my goals and I was jealous of them. 
And, you know, you don't want to feel jealousy. That's not a Buddhist, you know, thing to feel and keeps you out of balance. But yet when you're trying to follow your dreams, that jealousy can drive you a little bit. It can fuel that fire to keep you going. So Napoleon Hill wrote that book. Uh, what is it? Think and Grow Rich or is that it? Yeah. And he talks in his book about the secret to being everything, being the ultimate success. And not once in the book does he ever mention what the secret is. He doesn't say it. He just gives examples of people living it. And you have to kind of pick what it is out of there. And what I get out of that book, which is what I get out of all things, the mythic journey from Joseph Campbell and whatever, is if you have a goal that you want, you need to go after it. And as you go after it, you're going to face all kinds of obstacles. And this is you know, if you ever studied Joseph Campbell and the, the hero's journey and how that informed, you know, even Star Wars with George Lucas, it's always the same stories that we're seeing in our mythology that motivate us. It's somebody that wants to rescue a princess or get a golden fleece or stop the evil empire. And as they go on their journey, they constantly encounter forces that try to get in their way, evil people or potholes in the road or whatever it is. And if you stop at any one of those obstacles and turn back, you will never get to your destination. So you have to either find the strength to overcome it or train or get whatever tools you need to keep overcoming each thing to get where you want to be. Well, when I learned that that's what the mythic journey was and all cultures celebrate that in their human existence, I was able to look back now in the past and go, well, that's what I was doing. So when you ask, where did that come from? Where did the drive come from? It was my elemental human existence where I was driven to be like the heroic male, you know, journey and go get that thing. And maybe more so than other people. And that's why my goal was to become an action hero in the movies and represent that journey too, you know? That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, that, uh, I'm, I'm definitely right there with you. Um, always had the dream to like start some form of martial arts, just never did. Really well, wish I, would have, I wouldn't be shaped like a potato if maybe I'd pursued that at some point. But <laughs> hey, it's it's never too late. To, it's never too late to start martial arts. Every I truly believe in my heart. Every single person in the world should either do yoga or tai chi and or some kind of martial art every day in some way. I'm 54 years old. I just enrolled in a new Ishinru karate school, which is Okinawan karate. So I go in. I've been doing martial arts for 40 years. I go in and I put on a white belt. And I pay to take lessons and I'm training three, four times a week over at that school because it's just so good for your mind, your body, your spirit, everything. Miyamoto Musashi, the greatest swordsman of all time. He's the sword saint of Japan. He wrote the book of five rings in his nine precepts on how do you live your life? One of them is the way is in the training. And if you just meditate on that phrase, the way is in the training, the do, the Tao, all the ways that are the way. If you just have some practice like that, it can take your life to a whole other levels. So Chance, get on it. Go take right. some Kung Fu. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll get on it tomorrow. <laughs> uh, and that's so true. It's it's the behavior, it's not the, the outcome. The outcome is the lagging indicator. It's, it's the behaviors that got you there. It's every step that you're gonna take. Right, yeah. it's the doing. By doing, you get, you know? Yeah. That's the, th that's the steps. The thousand miles begins with one step, right? <laughs> Yeah, 100%. I, the same as Eric was saying earlier, I took away from your book, again, the positive, like no matter, even if even if it wasn't some, something substantial, you at least drove to the place, you were able to hand over your headshots, you were able to hand over the letter, and to you, even though some people may be incredibly discouraged, it was still, you were still doing something towards it and putting that out into the universe. That actually stuck out to me, too. Like, that was a, I don't hear enough enough motivational stuff like that so that that resonated with me it's right on well i appreciate that i struggle with not doing that all the time so yeah definitely definitely gave me a little boost man yeah that's the journey man you hope you inspire somebody else to continue their heroic journey so well, get yeah. them chance all right man. <laughs> all right ken i wanted to ask you uh, if i may uh, a little bit about pat johnson and uh, your all's relationship and i know uh, from reading the book there's a, a bit of a pupil uh, a mentor sort of dynamic there uh, that there has been and um i just uh i think from the the first time that you met him at that audition um and going through it's just he shines you can tell he's a very special person to you very close to your heart and uh i just wanted to see if you could speak a little bit on pat johnson 
Yeah, no, and I'm glad you asked it. You know, it's, what I love is that's a great question. And I've gotten that question some, a kind of a few times where people have noted that. And that so means so much to me that people are able to see what I feel about Pat Johnson through this writing. Because it was, I mean, it's, you know, it's not all easy stuff. It's not all sugar stuff. Pat got mad at me and did things and whatever, but I, yeah. that man was a father figure to me. He, I was a young, for those that don't know, Pat Johnson was the stunt coordinator on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. He's very famous in the American martial arts world. He was Chuck Norris's, uh, he worked with Chuck Norris and ran Chuck Norris's main school in Los Angeles. He actually appears in the movie Enter the Dragon with Bruce Lee. Uh, and he was most famously, he was the fight choreographer on the original Karate Kid with Ralph Macchio and Pat Morita. And, and he's, the a, he's the referee at the end. The yeah, referee. Yeah. Ref. And yeah. Ninth degree black belt. Yeah. He, so he's both martial arts and a little bit of Hollywood royalty in a way from these things that he's done. And he was the stunt coordinator on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So when I went to audition for that movie, I knew him by name, but I had never met him before. I'd seen him in the magazines. So immediately, you know, when you see somebody from afar, just like you, when you guys were talking earlier, um, you know, you're like a little nervous. You're like, who is this person? I want them to like me. I want to want to make sure that they feel about me the way I feel about them somehow, because I want to be embraced by whatever it is that they have. So I was nervous to go see Pat Johnson. Ultimately, I was able to rely on my years of dedicated martial arts training to get me beyond my nerves and have me give a great audition. I was yes. flipping nunchucks and swinging sickles around my neck and doing katas. And man, I was good. I was really good. Right. And uh, I nailed it. And that was enough to get Pat to put me on the, on the movie. Um, and then I did a few things. I got a few opportunities to really start to shine a little bit and, and use my stunt abilities and things. And, and Pat and the other stunt people started to use me a little bit more. Um, and then Pat, Ken, so what are you doing with your life? Started talking to me. Um, and ultimately, you know, I wrote Pat a letter that just said, this is my goals, Pat. I want to move to Hollywood. I want to be an action hero. This is my life goal. A lot of these other guys out here, you know, they're married with kids and they own karate schools and they're just working part time on this movie. But this is my life's blood. If there's my life's goal, if there's anything you can do to help me, that would be great. And Ultimately, he sort of took a shine to the letter and to me. And I just remember he looked at me at one point and he said, Ken, if I was you and know what, you know, you know what he say? He goes, if I was you and had what you got, I'd take over the fucking world. <laughs> and I was like, and, you know, and unfortunately, you know, you're 50, he was like 53 at the time or something like that. I don't know the wisdom that's in his words at those time, at that, at that time. But I watched Pat control all these foot soldiers. I watched Pat as... A martial artist. Pat sort of took me under his wing and started to guide me. Hey, I want to help you. I want to help you do this. When I messed up, he would call me out. He would call everybody out. I remember one of the first days he sat right by the door of the soundstage. And as each foot soldier walked through the door, he would look at his watch and he would go, Mr. Jackson, it is now 759. Good morning. He would say, Mr. Scott, it is now 750. It is now eight o'clock. Good morning. And then somebody walked in and he goes, it is now 8.01. You are late. If you ever plan on being late again, do not come to work ever again. Like he was like, you are never late. You are never this. I mean, he had so many rules and all this kind of stuff because and he never wanted to hear waiting on stunts. Because if you're on a set and you're making a movie and all of a sudden everybody's sitting around going, why aren't we shooting right now? The moment the AD yells out waiting on wardrobe. The wardrobe people are embarrassed because yeah. everybody's waiting for them. So he was like, if they ever say waiting on stunts, Pat, Pat would, I don't know what would happen. It never happened because we knew not to do it. So Pat was a real taskmaster, but he was really loving. He was such an interesting guy. He would work out boxing gloves every day. Uh, he would eat one meal a day. That was it. But he would eat everything he wanted all the pie, all the cake, all the everything, but it was one meal. Actually, it was one dessert, but he would eat everything. And then he would love to do Sudoku and everything. Um, but he, throughout Ninja Turtles, he helped guide me because he saw that I was young, energetic, and enthusiastic, but I also didn't know what the hell I was doing. And by, by I kept putting my foot in front of my, one foot in front of the other, and sometimes one of those feet would go in my mouth. 
And then I'd be like, oh shit, I got to make this up. And Pat, dude, tell me, hey man, this is one of the great things Pat Johnson told me after I kind of screwed up one day is he said, Ken, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, today I'm going to be an asshole. They just do some <laughs> stupid shit. And so he was trying to let me know, you know, it's okay. You were not an asshole. Just you did something stupid and this and that. So throughout Ninja Turtles, he helped to guide me. He helped me grow. After Ninja Turtles, he got me other opportunities in Hollywood, working in other movies. I had an appearance in a movie called Shoot Fighter, where uh, starring Billy Zabka. And I got to meet Billy Zabka. And then that started a friendship between he and I. By the way, he is awesome. If you ever get a chance to meet William Zabka from the Cobra Kai and all that, he is an awesome dude. So anyway... Pat, I mean, it's, it's a long-winded answer, but there's a lot to say about Pat Johnson. But it was a guy, a very famous, noble individual who, who imprinted on me, and I learned a lot from. And I wasn't always able, and still to this day, don't live up to what I think his expectations or standards would be sometime. Yes. But it's certainly one of the things and the touchstones in my life that I'm constantly striving for. I think that's part, probably part of the point, because I think a lot of us have someone like that similar, you know, in some regard uh, to where we could feel like we could never live up to uh, that standard that they set for us. And that always keeps us, you know, driving forward and pushing higher and higher and higher. There's never an end of the rope. There's never a peak at that mountain. Uh, you know, it's an endless uh, upward and onward uh, journey in that regard. Yep. So that's, it's amazing to have like someone like that in our lives. So uh, I really in particularly enjoyed that, those parts of the books where, where you spoke about Pat, because I, I could tell how much you cared for him. Right on. Yeah. That's the, at segues, I'll give this a little bit away. And I know this is a turtle thing, but what, you know, we find different mentors and teachers throughout our lives. It's part of that journey as you go from village to village or Island to Island or whatever it is you're thinking for me after Pat Johnson um, I eventually went to Hollywood and got into this other movie showdown and all the stuff. And I met a guy named Eric Carson and Eric Carson is an old Hollywood soul. And once I met Eric Carson, it was after I met him that I realized, Oh my God, this is the guy that directed the octagon with Chuck Norris, which was like my favorite Chuck yeah. Norris movie. And again, this is, you guys are young. So this is back when you may have seen this movie though, but he also produced like all the early Chuck Norris movies, like Good Guys Wear Black and all this stuff. He uh, directed Black Eagle with Jean-Claude Van Damme. He produced Nemesis with Olivier Gruner. He produced Lionheart with uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme. So once I moved to Hollywood and, and started living in Studio City, this guy became my next mentor. And he became like my screenwriting, producing, martial arts, movie making mentor. And through him, I, it was the same thing that you were talking about, Jonathan. He was, I was constantly listening to his stories and what he'd done and all these things. And I kept trying to live up to that next level to do the thing. And that's the journey that eventually got me to producing and directing my own movie was sort of learning from this guru and doing his Kung Fu stuff. So, yeah. yeah. Right. So, so, right so okay. yeah. And that's to say, I'm lucky that I've had a few of these, including my own father. I've had a few of these mentor like figures, both male and female in my life, in my life throughout. I love the part in the book whenever uh, you're uh, whenever you damage the camera. I don't want to spoil too much stuff in the book, but whenever you, know, you were younger and you guys were making your own movie and you borrowed the camera and uh, it had fallen over. And yeah, you were really well, look, I could I could tell I could tell stories all day. And I love that. That was one of my ex early experiences trying to make movies so I could learn how to be, a you know, an action hero when I was younger. Um, we can talk about anything and everything. And I'll tell stories from the book. But if you guys want to hang in the turtle world or you want to ask any specific turtle stuff, I want to make sure that you get that stuff in, too, because we can. Oh. So I don't want to tell you what questions to ask. You can ask me anything. But. That's, that's a good call. You're, you you yeah. can tell you're the kind of guy that you just sit and, you know, have never any conversations with. But, <laughs> and great. obviously you don't have time for all that. So, uh, oh, okay. Wow. Uh, one quick, one quick turtle question. Then I'll hand it over to these guys. Okay. So you mentioned in the book that you have what you call your uh, turtle treasure chest, oh, yeah. uh, where you have these sort of uh, relics and little things that you were able to, uh, you know, kind of smuggle off set, uh, cough, cough. And I just wanted to ask you, you know, a little bit more about that. Um, 
because as you know, we're, we're turtle nerds and, you know, we've got all the toys, all the things, the autographs. It's a turd. If you're a turtle nerd, you're a turd. So we're the turds. <laughs> okay. Okay, Ken. <laughs> uh, but I just wanted to ask you, you know, about some of those relics that you have, you know, some of those one-offs, uh, one in existence yeah. in your private collection. I was turning my back uh, during this video here because I thought I had something up here that was a one. Oh, here's, here's one one-off. That I have, I have a, I have stuff in the back, and I went from each of the first two Ninja Turtle movies. I walked away with various souvenirs, um, and I, I'll, I'm sure I'll forget some of them or whatever. But the the ones that meant the most to me really were I saved a call sheet from the first time that it was you know a call sheet lists all the actors and the crew and everybody that has to be on set that day. Mm -hmm. And written in there was like Ken Scott, Raphael. And it was like the first day that I was doing it. So I saved that. So that was important to me. Um, I also got a, a crew jacket back in the 90s, and the 80s and the 90s. Whenever you worked on a movie, you always got like this base, this Letterman style baseball jacket with those, some embroidery on the back. And the turtle one was badass, man. It was, yeah, it was all the turtles on the back. So I got, I got that crew jacket. Um, in addition, there were all sorts of little trinkets that we got, um, little Ninja Turtle watches that ended up being coming collector's items, uh, promo buttons for when the movie came out. I got some of those. As a matter of fact, somebody showed at a Comic-Con this past weekend and had one of these 30-year-old buttons. I was like, oh, man, I haven't seen that since the movie premiered. Wow. So there was all that promotional stuff. But the stuff that actually came from the movie uh, that I walked away with was... I walked away with a pair of size, Raphael's original on-camera size. They were made out of aircraft aluminum. Um, I walked away with a pair of turtle, Raphael's turtle hands. Um, and I walked away with uh, my, when I was a foot soldier, I was talking to foot number two. Yes. A lot of people don't know, but in the movie, uh, when all the foot soldiers break into April's apartment and Michelangelo goes, oh, a fellow chucker, eh? I'm yeah. the guy in black doing the nunchucks against Michelangelo. So I have a full, I had a full ninja outfit, but all I walked away with was the headpiece. Uh, and that was it. Well, unfortunately what happened was I left the turtle hands and the ninja headpiece in a box in my mom's attic in North Carolina. And mm -hmm. all the foam, all the chemicals that make up the foam latex were so delicate. Um, yeah. They degraded and it all just turned into dust. Oh, so no. was, yeah. I had a box of gray dust and, and that was it. So the things I was left with were Raphael's size and original copies of the scripts. Uh, I have an original copy of the script from number one and an original copy for my copy of number two. What's so great about the original script is it's not just a script. It's an entire storyboard of the movie. So it's like a full, it's like a 200 page graphic novel in a oh, way. Wow of yeah. the whole movie. It's all the storyboards on one side and the script on the other. And, and I still have the original like 31 year old script with the original Brad's in it and everything sitting over there. So I got that. I had the size and I got the size cast because everybody wants size. People are like, Hey, can I have that kind of, so I got a silicone made of the cast so I could pull uh, duplicates of it. Oh, wow. Um, and then I had a collector offer me an insane amount of money for the size uh -huh. and I could not say no. I was like, <laughs> yes, I would rather have that more much more money in my life than the these studio, things to yeah, drag yeah. to Comic-Con. The studio made you give them back, didn't they, Ken? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I got caught. <laughs> no, but no, but you know what, you, you know what happened was somebody was putting out um, fake uh, weapons from the movies. Somebody was cranking out fake Donatello bows and oh, saying, wow. hey, these were used in the movie and selling multiple copies of these things. Mm. So that back then around that time, or is this something like recent? No, this is, you know, in the last 10 years, five to 10 years. Oh, wow. You know, I don't remember when, but yeah, so there's a whole collector's market, you know, since I've been exposed to comic cons and stuff, this collector's market of what people are willing to buy and pay for and all that kind of stuff and trade and sell. I mean, I've been doing this for decades now, but uh, yeah, I mean, people will, they want everything, you know, everything oh so this was my name tag this is the original uh, pass that i had to go in and out of the studio wow. it says uh this is for tmnt i think it's oh yeah number two it says ken it actually says ken traum because that's my name i was wondering yeah. how you pronounced it yeah it's, it's like, yeah trout ken traum 
a little more than uh, an empty pizza box to sneak in, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, to be honest, I, I don't know that the pizza box was empty. I think I had a couple of pizzas. They were probably just yeah. cold, though. <laughs> <laughs> the irony of that, when we were talking the other day, prepping for this uh, interview, I think Jonathan maybe was the one that said it, but the irony of the fact that you got into the studio that ultimately got you onto the first Neutral movie by delivering a Domino's pizza, it was fantastic. Like, oh. that, you know I mean? Come well, on. again, you know, what's so funny is that does work out. And, and a lot of people are like, oh yeah, that's what a great thing. But pizza is my life. I mean, I know not everybody's watching this, but that's a tattoo of a piece of pizza on my <laughs> leg. I love, that's my favorite food. I love it. I, uh, I can't get enough pizza. I mean, it's bad for you. You got to watch out, but I cannot stop eating pizza. So pizza has been the fuel of my rocket ship throughout my life. <laughs> It seemed the appropriate way to sneak into a movie studio. It just worked though, you know? There's, it was hard, it, first of all, it was before 9-11. So security wasn't like it is today. Right, yeah. But, you know, I realized who doesn't open the door for the pizza guy? Everybody does. So I just drove right up to that security gate and man, I was so nervous, I was sweating. I probably had the shakes and uh, I thought that guy was gonna bust me for sure. And he just leaned. I said, you know, I got a pizza for delivery. Can I get in for production? And he I was looked looked at me and he's like, all right, go ahead. And I was just like, I, I, yeah, I almost shit myself. <laughs> I mean, if, if you're, if you have the uniform, if you show up and you have the uniform in pizza boxes, I'm going to say either you're actually a pizza person or you put in a hell of a lot of effort. Yeah. You know, <laughs> trying to get in there. So either way, I'm probably just going to. Right. Push and you, would, <laughs> you would never think to doubt the pizza guy and you don't want to be the person who holds the pizza guy up from somebody waiting for fresh yeah. hot pizza because then you're a dick so it's real so if you want to get anywhere pizza delivery uniform is the way to get in anywhere yeah do you yeah. know did that pizza or did that uh guard ever find like did you ever talk to that guard later do you still work there i like wish him? i could make up a story i'd make up a story and tell you oh yeah we became great friends i have no idea who that guy was at that point <laughs> okay, yeah because i was curious about how if you went in there one after about an hour or so why was he not like Okay, wait a minute. Where did that guy go? <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, you know, I'm sure they don't. Yeah, who knows? He's like, well, I can't leave. Oh, well, they'll handle it. They're probably, you know, <laughs> maybe, I mean, look, it's a, it's a movie studio, so anything could be going on. It's like, well, maybe he's in somebody's casting couch. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems like there are a lot of synchronicities when it comes to the turtle movie. It's like even that promo shot that you did at home in the, uh, in the homemade ninja outfit. Uh, when you're over the creek yeah it's oh like, yeah yeah what weapons are you holding in that you're holding size oh yeah that's true you know? it's yeah. like all these little synchronicities i, I, I don't know they're, they're i was crazy. born to be a turtle i was yeah. born to be Raphael. destiny right. man yeah. sorry to put you off there eric no no you didn't come up at all no um i i have one question i'm curious about um it so in reading the book in the, the first book one, I found a little bit of irony in the fact that you grew up in your life wanting to be an action hero and fight the bad guys, and then you ended up being a foot soldier at first and being the bad guy. But in reading the book and hearing you tell the story of Ninja Turtles 1 versus Ninja Turtles 2, it, it seemed to me like the, the, the experience on the first one was, was maybe preferred or something, or, or maybe you got more, like, you, I don't know. What, tell me the difference between the two experiences, I guess. Being the stuntman versus being the actor. Um. Being a stuntman was more fun because it was action packed movement. Being the actor turtle in the second one was a more of a, I don't have the right words to describe it, but it was more of a career enhancer, if you will. That's a yeah. stupid term, but I wish I had a better term for it. Um, the first movie there were both ascendancies in the overall spectrum of my life because they kept leading up and I, oh, I was an extra. Then I was a stunt guy. Then I was an actor turtle. Then I went and made showdown. Then I did. So that was all good. But in the movies, the, the Ninja Turtle movies themselves, it was kind of like an, an up and a down. It was like the first one, everything that could keep going right went right, 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 right. And then as I got into the second movie, it was all right once I got in the movie. And then once I got in the movie, a lot of shit started going wrong. And, and it cost me in a lot of ways, you know, like I started, I, I, I was young, like I said, I was young and I didn't know, I was, you don't think right sometimes and you're selfish and I was making stupid decisions. I was, 
you know, going out and partying at night with the stunt guys. And then the next day trying to work hungover. And it was, you know, and that's terrible. It's not professional work. And that, yeah. And that kind of stuff, you know, other prof- people who are older and more experienced and professional know when you're fucking up, even though you try to hide it or whatever and stuff like that. So I didn't do anything super major, but I fucked up a couple of times on the second movie doing stuff. And it tainted my relationship with, you know, the, the producers and things like that. Luckily, I was able to keep doing things and, and move on into uh, showdown with other companies and stuff like that. But I probably could have had a better uh, outcome, even in my career, had I played the second movie better. Because even look at Ernie Reyes. Ernie Reyes was a stunt double in the first movie. Ernie Reyes Jr. Stunt double in the first movie. Then he was Kino the pizza boy in the second movie. And then all of a sudden that same company went and made surf ninjas with Ernie. Now, granted, Ernie was the Michael Jackson of martial artists. He'd been a star since he was little and had his own TV show. So I'm not comparing myself to Ernie in any way. He's his own entity. But if had I played my cards better a little bit in number two, I might have had more opportunities through this whole connection of Ninja Turtles. So my experience on number one was great. And again, that's a really personal answer. When it comes to the actual performance as Ninja Turtle stuff, I really like number one because I was able to do all the action and the fighting and the nunchucks and work with Pat Johnson. And every day that was exciting. The second movie was really exciting because you were treated with greater importance, I think. And the whole movie process and all the puppeteers and all the hints and puppet tectronics were all focused on Mikey, Donnie, Leo, and Raph. And so that was a great feeling to be a part of that and want to be that and, and feel all that. So I loved all that too. Um, but it was just one, it was hard work. <laughs> it's really hard work working in Ninja Turtles. So you get you get nosebleeds, you get dehydrated, you have to breathe yeah. oxygen in between the, the takes and all that kind of stuff. It's grueling, grueling work. And that's why Judith Hogue, self-admittedly, I do a lot of panels with Judith, so I, I feel comfortable paraphrasing for her on this. One of the reasons she was not invited back for the subsequent movies was because she took such a stance in defending how the turtle actors were being treated. It was so difficult and so physically demanding and draining, torturous in ways that she really fought some fights that eventually, you know, she did what I did in the second movie and yeah. <laughs> you don't get invited back to the next one. But that's okay. The third movie was a piece of poo anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, all, we all agree with that one. Yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah, that was my favorite part. So I'm, I'm a Jim Henson like absolute freaking fanboy man so yeah wait until it got to that point in the book and i have to say man your experience with them initially in part two in london was was uh one of my favorite parts of the book oh right on. so is that still body a going cast. thing that you your body cast like do you still have that uh that that uh award uh, yeah yeah <laughs> label attached to your name yeah well for again for those that haven't read the book chance is speaking about uh my body cast got made so they could make my costume and uh, you could tell that uh, I was well equipped for the adventure, and that I was Jewish. <laughs> and I was Jewish. <laughs> and uh, yes, Raph got a reputation of being uh, quite the man on the set uh, because of that uh, body cast that was made. Um, but yeah, it was so much fun going to the Henson Creature Shop in London. It was the first time I had ever been overseas in my life. I was, you know, 21, 22 years old at the time. Um, they're flying me to London. I'm going to the Jim Henson creature shop. I get in this cab. They drive on the wrong side of the road, the steering wheels on the other side. I'm like, this is crazy. This is so much fun. And then we get off to this mysterious place. There's no like neon sign that says Muppets made here or anything like that. It's just a nondescript brick building in the middle of just a bunch of other brick buildings and homes and whatever. And you, can I help you? He's like, yeah, this is Jen. I'm here for Ninja Turtle. Come in, please. Uh, and then you walk in. And when you walk into the Henson Creature Shop, it is not a magical land of puppets and elves and things walking around. It is a workshop. It is a 
it looks like any other carpenters or whatever's workshop, just tables and shelves and buckets and bins and dirt on the floor and everything and clay. I mean, just buckets of chemicals and stacked in the corners and all this stuff. But in the midst of all this stuff is all these magician people creating these creatures and these sculptors up on ladders carving Toka and Rizar, the, the, you know, the animals from the secret of the uh, secret of the ooze. And they're these giant, I mean, you have no idea on a movie screen, they try to make things look big and they can, you're like, Oh, that's big. But until you stand next to a, like Andre the giant or something like that, you have no idea how immense those things really are. And that Wolverine and that snapping turtle, they were some big things, big guys, the big shoes and all that stuff. So anyway, watching those guys sculpt all that and seeing everything made and all the little pixie-ish London people walking around with their English <laughs> accents and everything. It was just like a magical land for a kid growing up in North Carolina to go there. And then what was really great was at some point when I was resting um, while I was there, there was just a little, a, what they call the green room where you can hang out and chill. And in the green room was a videotape player and the entire collection of Jim Henson's storyteller series. Oh, wow. And if you're not familiar with the storyteller series, it's almost like his, I don't know, it's kind of like a twilight zone, uh, you know, uh, crypt keeper thing, yeah, tell um, story but it's all idea. fairy tales, like Grimm's fairy tales. Right. And each one is this puppet based, weird labyrinth, dark crystal like thing. So I just sat there and watched video after video of Storyteller and then would go down and talk to people. And they were like, oh, yeah, I made this and I made that and made that connection. So the Henson Creature Shop was, man, what a treat. Yeah, that's amazing. Oh, that's, that's got to be so amazing. I'm so jealous, man. <laughs> I'm trying not to be, but yeah. Let it be. Let it drive you, Chance. Yeah. Fuel fueling that engine, man. There you go. <laughs> That's right. Chance body so that you can you can get down that path to get into the Jim Henson studio. That's right. I'm gonna be a I'm gonna be a karate expert puppeteer. Give me yeah. a couple, give me a couple weeks. That's all you need. <laughs> By the way, if you guys haven't seen it, see the movie Happy Time Murders. It's great. Oh yeah, I saw it. It's insane. It's it's freaking hilarious. It's yeah, don't show your kids. Yeah, yeah. Watch it. yeah. Oh yeah, I think I, we almost put it on at some point. And then I saw the actors involved. And I was like, hold on, no, hold on. And I had to check it out first. I was like, yeah, it's not going to fly. It's not a, not a kid-friendly uh, movie. But yeah, it's hilarious, man. Stuff yeah, so that, well, that movie was uh, produced by Brian Henson, Jim Henson's son. And Brian Henson was the second unit director on the first Ninja Turtle movies. That's right. But and I remember I'm, he was such a great, such a great, nice guy. And um you know, he grows up with his dad doing puppet shows, but in his dad's shadow and learning from his dad. And now he's gone on to become the artist and, and entrepreneur and businessman and everything that he is. But to work with him when I think he was 28 at the time that he was uh, second unit directing that stuff. And he was responsible for all those scenes where uh, they're young, the, sh the rat is in the cage and the baby turtles are in the sewer and all that stuff. So in addition to shooting a lot of action stuff, he shot all those eight millimeter films of the turtles when they were babies and things like that. Yeah, he's a cool guy, man. He's definitely coming to his own. He's he's yeah. out of that shadow for sure now. He's doing his own thing with it. So well, yeah, now he's a 60-year-old man. So you know, uh, <laughs> some people never get out of the shadow. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he definitely did successfully, man. Yeah. All right. Well, John, so, you got anything else? Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to ask um it says some of the work that you did. Uh, with your writing and directing, uh, you mentioned very briefly that you even did something for the CIA. I just yes. wanted to ask you what that was about. Well, or I can't tell like, you. No, you kind of thing. <laughs> no. What hap What happens is the CIA makes a lot of training films for their people, and it's or it's for families and for people who are going to be shipped and moving overseas for whatever it is that they're doing. And so they have to watch these films so they understand because what you're doing is you're basically picking up, you know, people that work in America and their families and you're moving them to a foreign country yeah. and they're going to do government work over there. And so 
people have to learn things. People have to learn mundane things. Like one of the films I worked on was I was the, what happened was on these films, I was the second unit director or the stunt coordinator and I would coordinate all the action and things that happened. So for instance, we were shooting a movie one time uh, or a training film and in the training film, um, somebody's wife was at a coffee shop out and about in the Middle East, lots of, you know, sitting on a cafe and said to somebody, oh yeah, I, I would love to have dinner with you, but my husband can't, he's going to be, you know, out of town or he's going to be deployed that day or something. And just by her saying this one innocuous thing, somebody at a nearby table overheard it, made a call, did a thing, cut to a scene of Marines marching, you know, doing a patrol down the street and they get blown up by an IED. Oh, wow. So there's, I did another one where oh, there was a riot at a South Af a South American college. And it was like, okay, what do you do if you're in a situation where there's a riot, you know, at a school, because maybe you're going to be working at a school or something. And so we did co coordinate this whole riot with people getting thrown over the sides of, you know, the uh, buildings and things like that, and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, training films for CIA operatives and their families. That's awesome. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty good. Cool <laughs> yeah, cool stuff. Uh -huh. So one more thing real quick, and you touched on it a little bit earlier. Uh, you were talking about whenever you first uh, met Pat and you uh, you were auditioning for uh, one of the foot stuntmen. And well, when you first walked in, uh, you saw like a hundred plus other guys, uh, you know, martial artists that were all working at, <clears throat> excuse me, working out and, you know, fit the part and we're all, and some of them were sort of world renowned uh, tournament fighters and, and you sort of instantly get this, you know, kind of, uh, you were a little, um, uh, you you were uh, you're a little down about it. You were a little, what's the word? Discouraged. You were a little discouraged. That's it. Hmm. And then, uh, uh, but then you sort of, you know, you were able to snap out of it and, and do the audition and did an amazing job. And so what I wanted to ask was, do you, do you recall that exact moment of like what made you sort of focus up and snap out of it? And, and sometimes, and I, I think about how you say you always have that kindred spirit to the, to the hero in, in the movies. And I, I think uh, for a lot of people where that really soaks in, it adds like this sort of vulner, vulnerability confidence mm -hmm. where you, you feel confident because you know that you're on the right side to do the right thing. And, you know, just is that something that you maybe kind of tapped into in moments like that? Yeah, I think um, I think that sort of ties hand in hand with the whole heroic journey theme that we've been talking about here today and that runs through the book. Um, you know, and it, it, again, for those that don't study it, just Google Joseph Campbell and the heroic journey and you'll see what we're talking about. It's 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 really the if you boil it down, it's the human journey, whether it's a trip to the grocery store or, you know, an Olympic athlete trying to achieve their dreams or going to the moon. It's all the same story. We have a goal. Uh, we set out with a certain set of tools and skills, and then we meet obstacles along the way, either people that are trying to stop us or physical obstacles or whatever they might be. And we have to equip ourselves with the tools, the knowledge and the know-how to overcome those things and to get over the fear and apprehension of meeting those things. So that moment of walking in there you know, none of us are uh, infallible, you know, nobody's a, a perfect brick wall. So yeah, when I see other people out there, especially really good people, I'm like, oh, uh, uh, reality sets in, you know, you're no longer in a vacuum thinking, I'm going to walk into that audition and be the best thing ever. All of a sudden, you see all these other people that really are good. And maybe even people that have beat you, in my particular instance, beat you at tournaments previously yeah. in a martial arts way. So I look at that and it's like, it's only natural to feel like, no, oh, man, this is going to be harder than I thought. And maybe there's not enough room at the party for me. But then what are you going to do? You're going to sit around and go, oh, man, I can't do this. And I, that guy's better than me. That guy's but No, you turn around and you go, you know what I've been doing? I didn't just get off my ass because I saw this in the newspaper. I've been training for this moment my whole life. I've been doing martial arts. I've been doing self-defense practice. I've been doing professional wrestling stuff with my brother. I've been practicing with weapons. I've watched the movies. I've stuck. I mean, you just, you just go back and you have to say, what do I have? What am I bringing to the table? If all you're bringing is Oreos and watching a lot of Kung Fu movies, then yeah, you have a right to be nervous and sweat it off. But if you put in the time and the effort because you knew, you know, to, to get that moment, what do they say? Luck is when preparation meets opportunity, right? 
So when that opportunity comes, if you're prepared, I think you just, I didn't know I was learning this lesson then, Jonathan, but I knew later in life that I learned the lesson, the ways in the training, just go back and rely on your training. You've done it. You've been there. You've, you've got this. And then from there, you know, along with martial arts and all that it teaches you about centering yourself and breathing, I had not only the belief in myself, but I also had the physical tools and tactics to understand how to channel my energy the right way. So it was really just perfect storm of all the things coming together. It was all brought together by my aspirations, my dreams to do it, the time I put in at the dojo, all the time I spent studying, uh, the time I spent sneaking into the movie theater of um, the movie studio dressed as a pizza guy in order to get this audition. Like it all was just, it was manifest destiny in a way. It was undeniable. Have you ever had to use your martial arts on the street? I use my martial arts on the street every day because as I walk down, I try to have awareness and sensibilities and about where I am and what's going on. I, I'm talking a full blown beat down, Ken. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, I think uh, I got in a fight uh, twice in college. <laughs> yeah. Hey. hey, but that's, that's the best. That's the number one rule in martial arts, right? Like if you can avoid the fight, then don't do it. Don't fight. I'm, I'm undefeated. You and me with Hey. Ken, I think I, I believe we're probably at, I'm running out of time and I want to be super respectful of your time. And I cannot thank you enough for being here with us today and with all of our groups and, and the live. And like I said, we're we're going to take the video, get it uploaded, and get it shared everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. to end, I'll ask one question, turtle related. Biggest, biggest takeaway from the two movies, biggest biggest win for you or you know most ex best memory something like that you know from the from the experience of playing a turtle okay um, i'll get more particular we've been talking about profound stuff all day today um with heroic journey and everything so i don't want to get all deep and philosophical i'll jump right into one particular selfish greedy moment that was one of my best takeaways from the whole thing at the end of the second movie teenage mutant Ninja turtles 2 secret of the use the day after we were finished filming, Barbara Walters wanted to interview the four Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. She didn't want to interview the actors. She wanted to interview Mikey, Donnie, Raph, and Leo. And she wanted to do it like in their secret lair. And she was going to put it on the Academy Awards special. Well, it turns out by doing that, it was right before the movie opened. And the producers were going to get millions of dollars in free advertising because the Ninja Turtles were gonna be on their Barbara Walters Academy Awards special. So you, it's illegal for union rules. You cannot, for if you hire an actor to work on a TV show or a movie, you cannot ask that actor to work on a separate project at, for the same contract. They're, you're only contracted for them to work on that one movie. So for us to actually film the Barbara Walters special, that was a separate project from the movie Secret of the Us. Um, so they had to give us a separate contract for that one day and pay us for that one day. And originally the producers offered us all a week's pay. And to me, I was like, that's awesome. Because it was like, I, I, it was like $2,000 a week or something like that, which, you know, is not huge money, but for fresh out of college and working away, it's like, I'll take it, you know? So I was all excited. About it. Well, David Warner, who played the professor in the second movie, he came back to the to four turtles. He came to our dressing rooms and he was like, Whatever they're going to pay you guys, I heard that it's a week. Don't do it. They're going to get so much free advertising. Tell them you want $20,000 each to do it. So anyway, we elected a leader for our little group. It was uh, Michelin who played Michelangelo. He went back to the producers. He told them we want 20 grand a piece for the day. They told us to fuck off, that they were going to get <laughs> the stunt guys to do it. But what they underestimated was the bond and the relationship that we had formed with the puppeteers. Yes. And the puppeteers stood up and said, we're not going to do this unless you do it with the actors. So there was a great compromise and the producers came back and they paid us each $10,000 for wow. that one day's worth of work. So what I walked away from with that was three things. I walked away with $10,000. I walked away with the fact that I had a wonderful and beautiful interaction with Barbara Walters that I talk about in the book. And I fell in love with her that yeah. one day. And I walked away feeling what you feel on every movie that was demonstrated by those puppeteers, which is 
throughout the entire turtle journey, especially with Pat Johnson and my fellow actors and all that through the, what you go through when you make a movie is an incredibly bonding experience. You spend three or four months or more with the same people six days a week, 12 or 14 hours a day. That's all you do. You're all working together, focused on this thing. And you create these bonds that will last a lifetime. Some will fade away. Some will continue for the rest of your life. But it's an incredible experience. I dare not compare it to going to war because that's horrific. But it's that same feeling of camaraderie of going through something challenging together. So the biggest thing I walked away from with all that is that sense of family that you can get working with people and the support and love that you can share putting together a project like that. Or no, well said, man. Definitely well said. Very well said. Very well said. All right. Well, I guess that just about wraps it up here. I um, just want to go ahead and show this off once more. This is an amazing book. Pick it up. Teenage Ninja to Mutant Turtle, Becoming the Real Raphael. It's a great read. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. The link should be in the, uh, in the post, guys. And Ken, thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, so it's my pleasure, guys. I appreciate talking to you. I love the questions. Um, for those that don't know, even you guys, you can go to turtleconfessions.com, and that's my author website. Um, there's links to Amazon to get the book there and everything if you want. But also, scattered throughout that video, I mean, throughout that website are little short video clips of me answering different questions about turtles and pizza and my favorite Kung Fu movies. And there's all kinds of stuff there. There's behind the scenes photos. There's a deleted chapter from the book. There's photos you can download of Ninja Turtle stuff. So there's all kinds of stuff to play around with on turtleconfessions.com if you want to check it out. Awesome. Yeah, we'll definitely throw the links, Absolutely. that link in, in all of them as well. Definitely. Right on. Correct. Guys, it's been, it's been a real pleasure. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks well. so much, Ken. Appreciate you, Ken. Thanks you have so a good much. night, man. You have a good All night. Right. See you guys. Cowabunga. 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 Cowabunga.